Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Marino Vigliotti. I'm a senior sales engineer, and today with me, uh, I have my colleague. I am Martin Chimek. I'm senior security developer and C++ developer in Kirio Technologies. And uh, today we will take you through the second webinar of the Security Threat mini series, and specifically we'll be looking at uh, uh, possible hacks into the system uh, and uh, whether you've been used as a spam or DDoS source, the webinar is recorded and uh, you will be sent a link to the registration. So let's start. So last week we looked at the uh, unprotected devices, today we look at uh, the unknown hacks and next week we'll be focusing much more on to the ransomware. So if you have a question about the ransomware, uh, please attend the next one. And for today, uh, we want to take you through uh, the question, uh, are you sure you're not, you've been used as a spam or DDoS source? To take you through this, we will take you through hacking uh, perspective uh, from a hacker or criminal point of view, not just from a company point of view. That's very important. We will set and, and uh, you will understand why uh, you might be hacked. Uh, and specifically, we'll introduce you to a DDoS attack uh, and uh, if you've been part of it, then uh, if your router has been hacked and you might not know about it, how uh, your DNS settings have been changed to uh, make sure someone else profit from that. Uh, using uh, public Wi-Fi, uh, the risks of uh, sending uh, confidential or credentials over public Wi-Fi. Then Martin will take a big chunk of the presentation and will uh, show you uh, how you can uh, scan workstation, PC, segments, and servers. And uh, we, it will finish with the, the final protection that you should have on your network with the IPS and IDS. We'll be steaming ahead now and uh, we will uh, just briefly uh, look again at what we looked at last week. Uh, company perspective on hacking it can be large or small company. Uh, they have very different approach. I will go very quickly through this one. And uh, the large companies, they have a dedicated team. They know the risks of uh, being hacked. They have, uh, uh, they have a reputation at risk. So the consequences of this uh, danger is actually investing money, keep up with all the security threats that are out there and uh, they actually do often a very good job. The, because we are focusing on SMB, uh, we want to uh, take a different approach. The SMB, uh, often they don't feel the, their reputation is at risk and they uh, see the security as a black heart and everything. And uh, that uh, has an a impact uh, uh, and uh, consequences that they probably don't even know about it. And today we will uh, change and we will want to show you from a hacker point of view what it's about. Hacking in the criminal world is all about money. No matter what, is a, you can have activists, which is fine, and we are not interested in looking at the political side and everything, but we want to look at the criminals, where what people do. This is a diagram we'll, uh, from the Wikipedia that they show that people hack so they can put something in your system, so they exchange money and send spam. This is a very specific case. However, it's all about exchange IT services for money. And next week, we'll look even more details about this. Let's have a look. So the criminal is a, um, is a, is a hacker that splits in two parts. So splits in the people they, te they team up and they attack large companies or they go for small companies. So for large companies, we said we don't really look at uh, uh, act activists where they try to defend something. We are more interested about uh, on a uh, team of professionals. They are the, the people on the left side of the diagram. They are actually uh, developers. They really code. They know the system inside out and they uh, are very good at IT, but they're not interested in, uh, in the black market. So they need to strike something with someone else. And the reason is that they go, they manage to hack into a system. Why? Because they want to uh, take uh, credit card numbers or user accounts, but they don't know what to do with it. So they are trying to sell this one on the black market. Then they make the profit and they move on. Uh, from a 
let's have a look from a hacker perspective what are the pros uh, pros are if you are looking at a large company they are very large uh, networks many entry points very very uh, easy for them to attack in a very different way however if you remember large company they spend money on uh, security so as soon as uh, the hacker uh, or the hacking team try to probe the security they could actually be shut down because they have active mechanism to detect this and can also take a long time to complete the operation months so this is one thing that you see on the news all the time this is uh, what uh, is uh, everyone knows about it the linkedin being hacked or the other big databases what you don't hear is the right side of the column let's have a look who they are these people can be a lowly hacker they can be a professional network of hacking you know business and hacking team together can be someone who's been hacking and sell something on 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 the black market or can be again another professional team which is targeting a different type of approach so it's very very different and they have two things in their mind either what we're looking today take ownership of um, your IT resources or devices or target uh, documents images something that is very important for the user why because in the first place they can actually generate the traffic using your resources they can take uh, CPU cycles to bit uh, coin mining or they can uh, encrypt some data in number two and extract some ransom which is the focus of next week so from a hacker point of view uh, what are the pros are when you look at about a small company there is a huge base to attack there are many unprotected devices security is not a uh, priority on the list however they don't know much about the, the targets so they need to do a carpet, uh, carpet bombing attack they need to probe every single IP address on the, they can uh, get hold of and everything else so it's very very different approach from the large company but uh, um, we have a look if you are in a small company so this is what we look like from a hacker point of view these are the, the um, you have you can think about security like an onion layer so the external layer is your um, outer devices the one that they are visible from the outside they are a little bit more uh, sensitive to something so generally can be a DSL router or can be also Wi-Fi access point if you've been using as a DSL router then when you enter into the layer inside uh, you have the inner circle which feels sa uh, safely protected because they have the outer devices but this is not correct so they tend to hack the different layers for example the firmware of the devices they might hack the OS or the or the applications and uh, let's have a look from a hacker point of view they have uh, two two initial tasks hack and inject code so the hacker needs to do a blanket approach doesn't know anything about the targets out there so he needs to look all the devices whether they are workstations they are servers or they can be um, uh, outer devices can be uh, ADSL routers so they tend to hack and inject some code in some they are su successful in some others they are not as you can see some they are a little bit more protected the aim is when they have grouped enough they actually have a big cluster of machines and they can move on to stage number two which is uh, identify the target the target can be a well-known company this well-known company has a website and they say to them uh, we uh, we are going to bring you down and uh, so they will ask some money and these people the business people say well mm, we don't think so uh, and uh, they they do the first uh, probe they send uh, a small samples of what they can do and they the and they will basically send in a lot of requests very small fraction of what they can actually deliver and will probe the system again uh, and at this point uh, the situation uh, is a, uh, is starting in a very different way if the people don't want to pay the money the the owner of the businesses or the business decision maker they say no we don't want to pay the money what is going to happen is next that the the DDoS attack starts money is gone nothing is on the table 
and the DDoS attack can start by literally unleashing the first wave, can be a lot of small requests, this can be your router out there, outside uh, of the boundaries of your firewall, that is sending a lot of requests, ping, 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 or can be actually requests on one specific IP address of the website. By then, the system start to idle, the IT people get involved, uh, or we have an attack, uh, we need to put some protection. At this point, there is no, nothing you can do because the attack will pr progress through the network, more devices will come into place, and at this point, the website is completely gone uh, out of control. It can be one minute, two minutes, ten minutes, can be also uh, hours. And this is, this is going to be uh, something that you might be part of it, and you might not know about it. Because uh, if you have your workstation in, infected, maybe you will notice through your firewall. But if you look at the bottom part of the diagram, it can actually be your router, can be your Wi-Fi devices, which is actually directly connected to the internet and, and is a part of it. And unless you look at the logs, you don't know about it. So how you hack a router? They need to look. They need to look for two things: your WIC credentials and your vulnerabilities in your device. Why? Because they, uh, once, uh, let's have a look what, what they are going to do. First of all, they can replace the firmware, is the OS of the router, and they can take full control of the device. They can change DNS to do something a little bit more sophisticated over a period of time, or they can run applications to launch one-off attack as a DDoS attack, or can launch a repeated uh, messages using the SMTP relay they are running from your router outside your control. So when you have a modem with the public IP address, uh, what uh, everything uh, is always on the table and is uh, the vulnerability available to everyone. These are always there, no matter what. There are vulnerabilities, monitor, uh, unmonitored devices, and this is normal. But the hacker combines it with the second stage, which will take advantage of your uh, WIC administration. You might leave the default password, WIC password. If you want to know more about this hacking, look at the previous webinar we did last week. We'll explain how you get to a situation where your router can be hacked and uh, just by uh, IP address and default password. The reasons we said they might do a uh, firmware upgrade with their version and you don't know about it. They can do DNS redirection. They can embed an application with an SMTP or with the ping. They can relay these uh, uh, messages uh, where they need it or they launch the DDoS attack when it's needed as, 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 as they want to. Replace firmware, right. We look at one brand, it's not uh, problem. This can be across everyone. Uh, the router is being hacked. Something is being injected there. You don't know about it. How can you find out if your router has been hacked? It's very little dif difficult. You need to replace the firmware. That's the only thing you can do. Let's do a high. So, for example, the top left will tell you the brand, and the top right will tell you the firmware. This is generally in your router. The next thing you want to do is do not upgrade the router from the page. You just need to log on onto the brand. Make sure you search for the specific router. Download the firmware, the latest, or at least the one matching one. Doesn't really matter. And this will guarantee that if an injection has happened, that will be removed completely. Next thing you need to do when you downloaded the firmware, is actually clear the logs, change your password, again, change your password, and review after a few days uh, after the firmware um, upgrades that you done manually. This is the safest and the best way to avoid be part of a DDoS attack or other things that get controlled. You can be used, uh, or your modem can be used in one-off utilization. Gets hacked, as we've seen, a little bit of an injection, and over a period of time, you have the first thing that uh, there is something uh, in injected in your device, you don't know about it, silent there, 
as you see, the tag starts, and you might notice, you might not notice, that uh, you are on the blacklist. Uh, you can be part of the blacklist because your ISP puts you straight away in there, push it there, and you go on the blacklist. Or maybe there is medication, you've been part of DDoS attack through the router, uh, presenting uh, your IP address as part of the attack. The blacklist is not activated by the ISP, and this is one of the disks. And basically, your router after is from a hacker point of view is totally discarded as as unusable. Or they may retry again if you are not on the blacklist. Or the other one is that they want to take ownership of some services, and the reason they inject the code, and this time they don't want to do one-off, but they need the data. They need the data from you, and you something that you don't even notice. You can see it's data that is uh, trickling through the time because there are very little logs and there is very little. Uh, you may be thinking, mm, okay, who, mm, who cares, you know, using my router. Let's have a look why it's so dangerous and what is going to lead into the security. DNS propagation. The hacker gets a hold of your router, can push the DNS to what they want. They provide their own DNS. So when you have a Wi-Fi connection with your mobile phone, Everything looks good. You can see your IP address is a subnet mask and everything. But um, what's this DNS? Is it matching what you've been asking? I don't think so. So the DNS has been modified, and this sometimes can be very difficult to see unless you actually see inside the, the device or even the router and masquerade. The, the DNS is actually being redirected to uh, um, another DNS, which you don't know about it. You tend to log in to the um, Gmail 365, anything prompts you with the incorrect credential. That was a fake pass, a fake login, then redirects you back to the original one, and you actually provided the hacker with exactly the credential that you have typed in. They don't need to decrypt, they don't need to anything. You just inserted your credential somewhere else, you don't know where. You can easily propagate this on a normal network, as you can see, if you are using the Windows, obtain the uh, automatic IP address, DNS, that's it. It's one off, gets reset, and then you provide the credentials to someone else. So DNS replaced, uh, sometimes they're uh, not very skilled, so the, the hacker will hack into the system, will still provide you with the, the basic uh, 100, 100, 100 is your public IP address, everything looks good, but uh, what you have done, you asked for the uh, automatic uh, ISP settings, they changed it to something else. So you can actually spot it. This is actually a sign that uh, your router has been hacked, unless you typed in those uh, settings. How do, you, how do you fix it? So the first of all, Guess what? Change your password. It means your password was extremely weak. There is a vulnerability. Replace the firmware and change your password. So set your DNS routing as yourself and see if they are propagated. You can use Google, OpenDNS, Level 3. Uh, they are very reputable uh, DNSs. Or if you still trust your ISP, they need to match with the night ISP uh, settings that are provided to you. Uh, they might not be same part of the subnet. However, they should be an IP address that you can link to a source you can trust. If you want to know more about hacking, if your router has been hacked, the vulnerability, there is a very good website. It's called routerpwn.com. You select the brand, you will see the vulnerabilities, you will see what uh, is available to hacker. Uh, and there are uh, plenty out there that uh, in combination with your uh, weak credentials will uh, push the hacker into your network without you knowing about it. Based on that, the second business uh, is uh, to steal credentials. They don't need to decrypt, it's too complicated, it's much easier to ask someone can you give me your credentials? Yes, I can give it to you. Let's have a look. How? If you are using your uh, public uh, Wi-Fi, 
maybe what you can use is uh, public Wi-Fi in your gym. You can go to a hotel. You can and uh, and they give you the public Wi-Fi. At this point, you don't know where your data is going through. As as you seen, you want to access the internet, and uh, you may be asked to reinsert your password. And guess what? You think that uh, something you type wrong. How do you know that your data has gone through a proper security, and uh, this security actually is not being hijacked by someone else? So if you are using public Wi-Fi, you possibly don't want to go to sites where you need to physically insert your login. And the only way you can be certain about it if you're using uh, encryption and you don't have to use um, basically credential typed in, in a form. So once it's done, the, the, the data will never be passed over to the, uh, to the hacking device. Martin, over to you. Oh, thank you, Marino. Uh, as Marino explained, uh, vulnerabilities and problems on uh, border devices, I'm going to take a look on devices inside your network. So let's start with some symptoms. Same as uh, illness, have symptoms visible or sensible at your body. Uh, computer viruses have symptoms as well. So, if you go to physician, you complain about, let's say, high pulse rate, which uh, occurs during no physical activity. This clearly signals that something is wrong with your body. The same can be applied to your computer. If you experience high CPU utilization and no application is running, it's a signal of some thing is wrong with your computer. Further, we can extend this to blood pressure. High blood pressure during no activity signals you're ill, something's wrong. The same can be applied to network traffic and input-output operation on your computer. So high utilization of hard drives signals someone is doing something wrong, even if you don't run any application. The weird behavior of computer, like uh, popping up of advertisement, strange icon in system tray, strange decorations of link in websites or windows, this can be compared to headache because you don't know what's going on, you don't feel well, it's unusual. The last one. Uh, if you got cold, you have a full nose, you cannot breathe freely, despite the day before you were breathing okay. Uh, same you can experience, for example, with uh, online video, the day before everything was smooth, and now the, it takes ages to load the video, it stops sometimes. This points to congested network but you don't do anything special, so there must be someone else uh, eating your resources. Uh, if those symptoms are not enough, you can take a blood sample from the patient. You can do the deep analysis to test for some viruses. For example, based on symptoms, you have a few ideas what should it be, so you do target it analysis and the same can be applied to your workstation uh, because there is a wide range of infections you can do this manually because uh, first you have to be an expert second it's very time consuming so luckily same as blood sample analysis everything on computer is tested as is automated as well. So uh, manually you can use uh, built-in task manager or you can use uh, more sophisticated like those from sysinternals. You can take a look 
on each process and guess whether it's correct or whether it's virus. But again, it's uh, very time consuming. So there are helpers in form of so-called anti-malware software which uh, combines knowledge of hundreds of security experts in a field in one small program that uh, automatically scans every possible place in your computer like files, memory locations, uh, processes, uh, network traffic and so on to test whether there is no or whether there is the infection. Uh, basically any antivirus contains such a tool but uh, mainstream antiviruses tend to be a, like a prevention tool. On the other side these anti-malwares are helpers during the cleanup session so they can uh, delete a uh, locked file, they can do something during startup if it's a uh, rootkit and so on. So don't get misled by their names because these companies like Super Anti-Spyware or Spybot or AdAware started with a single purpose tool but uh, over the years they evolved into fully working products over all types of malware. So, Mar so, exactly. so Martin, I wanted okay. to ask you, the, you said there are no mainstream uh, brands here, so you're telling us that these, uh, these are very reputable uh, companies and that they get sources from uh, professionals? Yeah, these uh, tools are best of in the brand, in the, in the field. Uh, probably you don't know them well because they don't spend so much money on advertising. They are easy, easy to find in some forums and just by googling because they score very well in the cleanup session so they don't need uh, big billboards. And of course they also provide a real-time protection of a memory so Generally, they do very similar service to antivirus, so there is a blur bar border between antiviruses and anti-malware tools. Okay. So let's take a look on a few of them. Uh, here we have a combo fix, which on first sight you say, ah, it's ugly and so old, but administrators love its flexibility because of its command line interface. They can use it in scripts for startups, they can uh, launch it remotely and of course the combo fix scores very good, it has a very good reputation. On the other side of the spectra here we have a super anti-spyware which uh, started as I said just only anti-spyware tool but evolved in very useful tool with nice user interface. Uh, even non-trained people can install it and click one of those buttons and everything else is done automatically or using some wizard dialogues. So uh, this is uh, good advice for your family if they have problem or even it supports real-time protection of a memory so it serves good as a protection of workstations as well. So, um, as we see, we can inspect the workstation clearly. So that defines the first category of computers which we take care of. Uh, those are workstation tool. Uh, mainly they are on Windows, on a Mac there are of course similar tools, same holds for Linux. Now we have to introduce second, cate second category which is a server tools because uh, running uh, using workstation has completely different flow. Uh, user run almost random applications, they visit sites randomly, they have a lot of traffic which is not constant, it changes day by day. 
On the other side, servers have usually just one application with just one or very limited set of protocols. Uh, there is no user sitting at the server and doing something. There are users outside in the internet sending requests to server. So you cannot experience those symptoms as I talked about in the beginning. So what we can do about this? Um, sorry. Uh, such servers has... Let me rewind. Such servers usually have uh, application firewalls and uh, server firewalls like uh, IP tables and some uh, protection mechanism fail to ban, for example, that uh, reads the traffics and logs and changes rules in server firewall accordingly. So in this case, uh, you might think uh, your server cannot be hacked because it has a self-protection mechanism. But uh, let me explain what is so-called zero-day vulnerability. You have a program and there is some flaw introduced by, for example, lazy programmer. And this problem is introduced somewhere. We don't know whether it's here from beginning or from last release. The important is that there is a time when such vulnerability is disclosed. Some security expert might find it, some hacker can find it, doesn't matter who. From this point, uh, underground start exploiting this vulnerability and using it in their exploit kits. Uh, about exploit kits, we will be talking next week. Uh, this exploit means um, they can combine knowledge of the vulnerability and their own code that can be run on your device. Uh, since exploit is released, you are entering the zero day time span in which you are completely vulnerable to this attack. No matter how good antivirus or application firewall you have, there is no protection because antivirus don't know about this threat, so they don't have signatures and so on. Fortunately, antivirus company catch up very quickly. So after a few days, you have anti antivirus signatures and you are protected at some point, for example, on workstations. However, uh, sometimes the communication is encrypted and the only cure against this attack is to use patch issued by vendor. Uh, these are of course released quickly as well, but their application relies on administrators or users themselves. So the zero day time span can be lo far longer than necessary. So this is a life cycle of a vulnerability that proves that even if you use antivirus, you can get infected. Uh, let's see statistics from 2014. Here we have a table showing how many vulnerabilities were in each of mentioned application. From this point of view, it seems that uh, generally safe operating system contain a lot of vulnerabilities. But uh, let's take a look at Flash Player, which has just one-fifth of vulnerabilities as Explorer have. But if we take a look at the seriousness of such vulnerabilities, we see that uh, there are not so many serious vulnerabilities, but in the case of Flash Player, they clearly outnumber the Internet Explorer. So 
uh, total amount of vulnerabilities doesn't matter because some of them might need physical presence of an attacker at the computer or you running some special software but those most serious don't require anything you just visit the page and you're infected so speaking about the flash uh, it's a constant problem on the internet there are a lot of servers using flash as a video player despite we have uh, HTML possibility of playing video so generally you can live without the flash but sometimes your job relies on accessing web pages that they that don't have any other option than flash you can find out whether the page using flash by right clicking the video because flash player always have its own menu showing the version of flash so if you are one of the person requiring flash we recommend update regularly but it has its drawbacks as well suppose the situation we visited an innocent page and the semi-automatic upgrade mechanism of flash triggered this update dialog trained people can tell whether the dialog is genuine or fake however non-trained people just see yeah it's Adobe Flash Player update I can download it it's safe but if there is an advertising network being compromised with a malicious advertisement it can fabricate so good dialogue that you cannot distinguish between the genuine one and the fake one so we recommend not to download flash over this window even if you visited some innocent page that should be definitely clear because it's a big company with a good reputation and we offer to go directly to Adobe's where you can verify that you are talking to legitimate Adobe server first from the from the address bar and you see that the certificate had been verified so here you can click install and you are sure you are downloading the correct clean update of a flash player uh, Martin, so just Martin, can we just go back one step because there is a question from uh, Bastian which is very relevant to Adobe Flash. Say when you when you change the platform, uh, you cannot watch, uh, for example, Adobe Flash Player. Uh, the aim uh, of this webinar is to explain you this. The problem there is so much out there in the market. Even Adobe would like to get rid of Flash but there are advertising companies which have spent a lot of time in uh, investing in flash and uh, if you look back at the uh, exactly the, the step below here uh, you have a situation where advertising is inserted in the video and when a company wants to go and uh, provide the video and make money from advertising the advertising company will force them effectively to uh, use a flash so that's the main problem in the market and is not an easy one to address uh, so we are not saying to people don't use flash where is about user education you don't click on some some pages you don't click on something you don't click on ad, uh, install flash from something that you don't know that is the the part that we want to stress uh, is almost impossible to live without flash and uh, in these days even if uh, Martin said HTML5 is available many companies in the background they are not going to get rid of it so thank you and this is very important keep addressing this to to your customer and your employees so Martin we can move on to the next stage okay I will add some note to the flash at the end that we didn't manage to put in this presentation so let's continue with the flat networks um, 
In last webinar, we identified that some devices have no self-protection mechanisms, like uh, usually those embedded devices like cameras, electronic point of sales, and whatever. So these are likely to get hacked and serve as an entry point to your network. So if you have a flat network, everything is connected using switch and the compromised device can interact with, let's say, workstation directly without being noticed by the firewall. So what we suggested last time is to move those vulnerable devices into a dedicated segment, so we force them to go through the firewall if they want to interact with the rest of network, which is workstation segment. We already know that these devices can be pretty well protected and we can even issue regular scans of memory, of files, of network traffic, registry and so on. The new segment we are going to introduce now is a server segment because as I said before, a server has no operator. so it only utilize its own application firewall, server firewall, and additional tools. But uh, in combination with the zero-day vulnerabilities, these servers can be hacked as well despite all the protection. So what you need to do is to incorporate some remote uh, server monitoring that uh, sniffs the traffic, the shape of the traffic, uh, that uh, reads logs, and so on. And you will be notified that something weird, unusual is happening, and you can start investigating using some anti-malware tools. OK. Uh, Suppose the situation you have a firewalled network with a server segment and the server inside. The server accepts requests from the outside at some moderate rate and you can measure this traffic and you obtain chart like this. So uh, basically looking at this chart, you notice that there is some pattern behavior. For example, during the night, there is no interaction. Uh, the maximum level of communication is somewhere about 200 kilobytes per second. Uh, you have a peaks, you have a lows, and generally it should remain the same. So, um, if those values are not met, you should uh, be aware, you should be notified and start investigating server. But again, you don't want to log in into each server and look at the traffic charts. You need some automation. For this purpose, there are two tools. Uh, both of them serves for SMBs to enterprise. Uh, both are free. Uh, the Check MK can monitor the basic functions of a server like CPU rate, network utilization, disk space, I.O. operations, but it can also read logs. It can uh, use some plugins that uh, analyze the log according to traffic. It does some, let's say, magic about it and can spot uh, differences in patterns learned before and they can notify you. Uh, once you're notified, you can inspect logs more deeply and you can end up in a false positive state because you at successful advertising campaign, so the traffic triples and there is no sign of hacking on the server. But 
it's always better to be safe than sorry. Another good stuff about the Czech MK is that you can buy plugins that can take uh, that can take values out of exotic devices like web cameras, cheap modems, um, unknown unknown devices like printers or whatever. So from headless device you have a very well monitored device. Uh, on the other side there is another free tool called Cactinet which is based uh, exclusively on SNMP protocol which is uh, well implemented on big servers but uh, usually completely missing on small devices like those web cameras, printers and so on. Uh, the reason why this is better for SMBs is that uh, SM small businesses usually have servers hosted in data centers so you don't need such special tool as Check MK. And of course you can set up triggers if some value goes above defined level and you're notified that something weird is happening. Okay, uh, these tools only check values you define in advance. So if you define you want to monitor CPU and forgot to monitor utilized RAM, you are not aware that RAM is being filled up. And of course if you don't monitor the traffic, you are not aware of strange traffic. For that purpose, we have something which is called intrusion prevention system or intrusion detection system which uh, gathers knowledge of a traffic shape going from random sources they expect every attack being held or every infection being used so it fills the whole between what you have configured in the monitoring tools and between the rest after your server being hacked. Uh, how does it look like inside? Uh, you have a lot of devices issuing some traffic that you don't monitor and you have a set of rules. Those rules are created by hundreds of hundreds of experts all around the world and uh, they describe the traffic based on source address, destination address, rate of requests, uh, shape of each packet on parts of a payload. So they have concentrated all the knowledge into hundreds of rules running in a very simple mechanism of intrusion prevention. You can select what to do if some rule matches because some rules can uh, effectively prevent the attack but some can just tell you that you are being under DDoS attack because every other requests coming from different IP address and it's very difficult to tell whether you should drop it or not because it's mixed with regular requests. Uh, every intrusion prevention have some detailed setup. For example, if you run a web server on non-standard port, it's a good that you can set uh, that you can tell the intrusion prevention system to perform scanning on that port despite it's not a HTTP but it will treat it as an HTTP. Here is our example uh, on ports 8000 to 8080 it's treated as an HTTP. The last part of intrusion prevention system 
is the blacklist database. Uh, it's a set of IP address being compromised so you can prevent users to go there in the first place which prevents them from visiting malicious website that distributes the infection. Those lists are updated daily because uh, the speed of reaction is essential in this case and of course some IP addresses uh, should be released from the blacklist after they are cleaned up so you need to update them and this is of course done automatically because doing something manually in terms of security is uh, very unreliable so intrusion prevention system discards malicious requests and malicious traffic Thank you, Martin. Just one second, and I would like to ask you. So often people have maybe a, a router, and they say you have an IPS, or you have something. Uh, is it the same thing? Or this, uh, the, uh, what to makes a difference from running uh, low-end firewalls uh, from a firewall which has a, a fully uh, IPS IDS installed, and uh, what's, what people need to look for? Uh, I'm afraid it depends on the brand, but uh, usually those cheap routers have those rules embedded in their firmware. So after a few months, all those rules are very outdated and they are not protected against new threats. The good IS, good intrusion prevention system should have visible update button and uh, version of rules being used best with the date from which they are so if some zero day vulnerability is exploited you have the next day update and you are protected against this Perfect. thank you so we don't recommend to rely on intrusion prevention system in cheap modems and you always have to buy a SMB solution at least. Thank you. So we complete now by summarizing the uh, hacked uh, parts of your network. So if you had uh, weak credentials, you could have had your, uh, your firmware replaced, do it yourself. Download it, manually upload it, change the password, and move on to the next stage, which is your uh, firewall next generation that you need to look into that. Separate your devices, which are not protected, say, uh, or they are not pro protectable with antivirus, then you have devices which can be protected by antivirus and can be scanned workstations. Manual uh, download of the Adobe Flash, very, very important. You will see next week what is going to happen uh, when you go straight into uh, an Adobe Flash for, uh, uh, that will cause you a few headaches, to say the least, ransomware. And finally, if you have a service like mail server or you have a small CRM that needs to be accessed from the outside, put on a separate segment. You're looking at here a small firewall, doesn't need many rules, doesn't need many things. Needs enough ports, four ports, enough to communicate to the outside world and the three segments. And is this is a very simple solution. So I will now uh, just let you know, next week we are looking about the ransomware. There are a few 